and how this okay. is beneficial to service okay. providers, high care directors, as well as individuals. Okay. So, as I begin, I'm going to go ahead and start with our go to assist uh, remote support. And hopefully you're all able to see my desktop okay. So this is a landing page for GoToAssist. And as you can see in the top left-hand corner, we have remote support. We have the service desk and monitoring. Remote support is broken up into two pieces. One is the ability to support attended sessions. That means there's somebody at the other end. If you get a call and somebody needs assistance, you can try to resolve it over the phone. But more times than not, it's going to be much quicker to be able to look at their desktop and assist them, walk through the process, or even fix the problem for them. And that's called attended session. So the technician would simply log into their uh, GoToAssist account, um, and then it could go ahead and click to start a support session. At that point there, you're going to generate a code. I can now direct the end user to my website and ask them to put in the nine-digit code. I can also email them the code, and all they have to do is simply click on the link, and it's going to ask me, you're about to share your desktop with Brian. Would you like to continue? They click yes. I can now look at their desktop. I have keyboard and mouse control as well. At this point, I can also I can just watch what they're doing, maybe highlight certain areas on the desktop where they should be clicking. Or again, since I do have keyboard and mouse control, I can also go in and uh, start to work and assist them. The other is unintended support. And that is the ability to get to a machine where there's nobody on the other end. And this would typically be a server where I might have to go in after hours or maybe to an employee that needs to have his computer fixed before an 8 o'clock meeting in the morning. I would then create a list of the different devices. If you, as you can see right here, I can see which devices that are online. And all I have to do is simply click Connect, and I get connected to those devices. I can also have different groups. And this could be campuses. This could be uh, different customers if I was an MSP. Or it could be different departments or remote locations. And by clicking on any one of these other groups, it would pull up a different list of devices. So that's if I'm actually logged into the support page. But once this is run once, I simply have to go down to the systems tray here. I can right click. And again, I can start a remote support session. And there's my code. So again, I can just click on an email to, to send the email to them. Or I could direct them to in this case, fastsupport.com, but you can also have this hosted on your own website as well. I'm going to give an example of a customer website that allows them to uh, start a remote support session as well as uh, open a ticket or uh, search a knowledge base. So once I'm in session, this is a server that I have in Arizona. This is a workstation that I have in Santa Barbara. I can actually be in up to eight sessions at once. Some of the features that I can do once I'm in session is maybe I need to invite another technician and a colleague in to join me, and we're going to collaborate on resolving the problem. Or maybe it's a situation where I need assistance, and I want to escalate this to a Tier 2 person. I can then invite the Tier 2 representative into that session, explain to them what I've done and what the problem is. Once they acknowledge that they understand, I can drop off the call, and they can continue working with that customer, or in this case, it would be a server. I can actually have up to uh, seven other sessions going on. So it could also be used if I want to train some interns that were coming in. I don't want to give them keyboard and mouse control, but I want them to watch the desktop. And they could be located you know, around the globe as well, being able to watch as I'm working on this particular machine. Some of the other tools that I have is that if I did get a call from an employee while I'm working on these two unattended machines, I can start a new session, which is going to generate that code. I can also join somebody else's session. Maybe one of my colleagues needs assistance, and I'm going to jump on for a few minutes, assist them, and then I can come back to working on these machines on my own. I can also pull up, um, I can look at my list of different groups or customers. If I need to pull up another machine, I can do that as well. I can do reverse screen share. So maybe I want to show them what's running on my machine. This is the way it should look. This is how the application should appear. Or maybe I have a small deck that I want to show them. I can also, um, if maybe the, the font's a little bit too small and I want to get into the browser, I can actually blow it up for my comfort level without affecting their resolution at all. In fact, they'll have no idea that I'm actually changing anything. Another tool that is helpful is system diagnostics. So if I'm working on a machine and the, the user's complaining that their um, application's running too slow, 
oftentimes it could just be the memory that they have. Most users probably don't know how much memory they have or maybe even the difference between my RAM or hard drive. But right here I have all these tools right at my fingertips. I can see who the user is, what IP address, what memory they're using. I can see the different services. I can also run this multiple times so that if I wanted to make a policy to make a snapshot when I first start a session, I can then later in the session review back and say, all right, what did it look like when it first started? So I know what services were stopped and running when I first started this session. I can also save this locally as a text or an XML file for future dates if I need to go back and re refer to it. One of the ones I skipped over here was file transfer. Another is two-way file transfer. I can send files. And there's no size limitations either. It could be a 5 gig file. It could be an MSI, an executable, or even a VBS for that matter, because you're creating a secure tunnel from your machine to that end user. We also have chat so that if the end user happened to be at an airport or somewhere that they were not able to speak, I can put into the chat, all right, I'm about to reboot your machine right now. You don't need to do anything. I'll just need you to log back in. But we don't have to reestablish this connection. The connection itself to their machine will actually stay open. I can put notes, so if there's something in here that maybe I noticed or maybe I mentioned to the employee not to disable any virus, they're leaving their machine at risk, uh, I can put that in. So any other technicians, when they go back and they're dealing with this employee or maybe myself, I can remember what I did when I went in that, into their computer for the remote support session. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is just an introduction to service desk, okay? And service desk we're going to talk about um, after remote support, but while we're in the session, this is the first way to be able to create a ticket. You know, I know IT departments want to be able to track everything that they do, but they also don't want to spend 10 minutes logging something that took maybe one minute to fix. Oftentimes, technicians just forget about it and move on to the next project without ever logging it, and all those events and tasks add up that are not being tracked. So by having it integrated with your remote support, if, the, if I happen to notice that there was a problem on one of the servers, maybe I couldn't get my email and I logged into the Exchange server and I noticed that store.exe wasn't running, I could simply come up here and create a new incident, explain what the problem is and that I'm working on it. So all the other technicians that may get calls about this or notice that there's a problem, understand that Brian has already noticed the problem and he's working on it. Or maybe the problem has already been reported and I happen to be the one that logged in. So I can pull that up by the incident ID, I can pull it up by the exchange server, any other keyword or maybe the particular person that created that incident, I can pull it up and then I could close it or add notes to it right from within my remote support session. We're going to get more to that um, from the user's ability to create tickets on their own to the technicians and how they can handle and process those tickets. The last thing I'm going to talk about for the remote support here is just um, I mentioned before that there is like a view only mode. So if I want to explain to somebody, hey, if you deleted a file, chances are you can find it there. Or if I want to point to how to run a certain application, I can move that around so they, they can understand what I'm referring to. Again, I can go back to my drawing mode at any point, or non-drawing mode. I can also reboot the machine and reboot it into safe mode. Uh, this is very helpful when troubleshooting, uh, especially if there's some viruses on a machine. I need to get on, go in with a limited mode, but I don't want to lose that connection. So I can go ahead and reboot it. I can do my work in safe mode. Once I've disabled whatever virus that might be in there, I can go ahead and reboot it again and then run it in regular mode and hopefully the problem has been fixed. But again, it's only one connection to that, to that device. So I'm going back to my, my landing page. Now, a couple other things I want to mention while we're on here is um, there is support for iOS and the, the support is the ability to create profiles for an iPad or an iPhone user. So what this allows me to do is actually create a profile maybe for some salespeople in my organization. And it's going to allow them to be able to connect to the VPN from their phone remotely. Maybe they would need to get connected to the wireless access point when they're in the office. Or maybe they want to set up their email for them as well. So I can create these profiles. I can then push it out to them through a chat session and to be able to get their devices set up. Now Apple does not allow remote control screen sharing of an iOS device. Um, but one of the things that we are able to do is actually um, get screenshots from the user who may be at the airport and they can get to the internet, they can use their phone, but they can't get their email. So what they're able to do is actually send over what the error message that they're getting or show me what the settings look like and I'm a technician. I can review those. I can, ex I can see that maybe they got the wrong port numbers 
with the wrong domain that they're using, or maybe SSL is not turned on. But they say a pitch is worth a thousand words. So being able to see what the problem is on that iPhone helps me identify the problem and, and propose a solution, even though I wouldn't be able to make the changes myself. Now, Android, we actually do have the ability to run um, remote support sessions to an Android. I should say to and from. So a technician can actually use an Android phone or tablet. They can use an iPad, and I believe coming out next week, they'll also be able to use an iPhone. So when we talk about uh, a world gone mobile or you know every you know mobile computing, not only is it important the end users that are on mobile devices, but technicians are no longer just sitting at a desk at their computer supporting people. Oftentimes they're maybe walking around the office or attending meetings, and they may need to be able to get access to a device from at any point so they could actually start a session from their mobile device and then maybe move to their workstation and then transfer that session to their PC or their Mac. So having that flexibility is nice, especially um, with uh, trying to do more with less. We also have the unattended. So to set up unattended on those machines, there's a couple of different ways of doing that. One is through an executable where you just put that on a network share or just download it on, uh, on, on computers and then just have it run as an executable. Another is an MSI package. This allows you to push them out in bulk to groups through group policies and another third party tool that works with MSI packages. And we also have one for the Mac installer. We also have full reporting. We keep all that in to, or we keep all that data for up to one year. So at any point you need to go back and see, you know, who got access to what machine at what point for a lot of whether it be HIPAA or PCI certain compliance testing uh, that is necessary to be able to um, show who accessed what. And we also have the ability to record those sessions. Now this could be turned off, but it's turned on by default. And these recorded sessions are actually stored in the cloud. Now why is that a benefit as opposed to leaving it on a local machine? If I have a technician that maybe did a session early in the morning before they caught a flight to New York, that, that file that's on their uh, computer, a local computer that they ran that device from, may not be accessible for up to six hours. Or maybe that they're an intern and they did something that they weren't supposed to and they may accidentally delete that before uploading it to the network share the way they're supposed to. With GoToAssist and the fact that it's stored uh, securely in the cloud, you don't have to worry about that. Administrators have access to those files, recordings at any point, so they can always go back and see what it is uh, at any point without the ability of it being lost or unaccessible due to it being on a local machine. At this point here, I'd like to move on to the next module, and that would be the service desk. I'm back in here. So this is the technician's view, and I can see the different tickets that are open. Like I, I also have these different views here where I can say, let me just see the priority ones. Let me see tickets that have been created today, or let me see tickets that have been assigned to me. But before I get too far into the technician's view, what I'd like to do is talk about how your end users, and these could be customers or these could be employees, are able to create tickets. A lot of IT departments are trying to reduce the number of phone calls that are coming in so that they don't have to waste time logging incidents where they can have that done online or through an email and then the technician is able to touch base with them when they're, they're available. And that, that information is entered through the user through the web portal or through the email. So our demo site is called Century Ecology. So I created a email, just a Gmail for Century Ecology or century.demo. And basically, when it and it just gets sent to whatever su uh, support alias that you use in support at abc.com, or in this case, we're using support at centuryecology.assist.com. So, whatever friendly user alias that you'd like, that or that employees or customers are using today, all you'd have to do is simply forward that to the service desk uh, server, and it's going to log that ticket. It's also going to send a confirmation, letting them know that we have received your your email and a technician, whatever message that you'd like to get to them, these are, this is customizable. Um, the employer or end user has the ability to respond to that email. Maybe they want to add additional information, or maybe they resolve the problem on their own, and they just want to let you know, oh, you know, my USB camera's working. I plugged it into the USB port. So what that's done is actually reduced two phone calls, one to open that ticket and the second one to, to actually close it or you know, to let the employee explain how they fixed it. Now the employees also have the ability through this email is to click on to see the log. Maybe they want to uh, see the status of what's going on with that ticket that's still outstanding. 
perhaps they're waiting for a keyboard or some other part that's been shipped into them so they can see the tracking number, the FedEx number, so they can look to see when it's supposed to be in. Or maybe it's been escalated to Tier 2 and they can get, again, they can get updates. So the next part is of creating a ticket would be through the web portal. Now this is integrated with Active Directory. So I can go ahead and log out and an employee would simply just have to come up and click on a link for them to be able to open a ticket and it logs them right in. So they don't need a separate username and password. Uh, at this point right here, if it's some minor issues, you'd like them to at least make an attempt to resolve it on their own. Maybe they're, they just got a new iPhone and they want to set it up for email. By putting in a search for iPhone, they can see that we've got at least seven documents here. I can click on one of the, the articles. I've got some settings. I've also got some screenshots. If this helps but doesn't quite resolve my issue, I can look at these other related documents. This one has some more screenshots, which could be helpful in helping me resolve it. But at some point, you know, they may just say, you know, hey, I still need help, and I want to open a ticket for IT support. Now, they don't have to go through the knowledge base you'd like them to. That would help resolve a lot of minor issues. But if they want to create a ticket right away, they can go ahead and click on uh, create a new incident. At that point there, they can, um, you can cr have certain ways to route it. If it's a MacBook, maybe that goes to one team, or if it's a PC, it goes to another team, or maybe it's hardware, software, whatever it may be. This is optional, but if there are different teams that may respond to a different issue, depending on the nature of that issue, you can use um, the customization you know, from what the employees put in, or customers for that matter, to decide who's going to route that, you know, who's going to accept that. And then you can have some additional fields down below here too. Is this a corporate computer or is this a BYOD? Uh, is this a virtual machine or is this a, a physical machine? Employees can also make requests. And the request could be for software, hardware, training, access to a certain file. They can also ask a question or make a suggestion. If you didn't want some of these categories or options out here, it's very easy to customize and remove that. The final way that the portal is helpful is that they can, employees can see a list of all the different tickets that they've had in the past. So maybe I got an iPhone four years ago and a technician sent me the configurations. Well, chances are those haven't changed, so I can just look at that, that case. I can look at the settings again, and I can put that back into my new iPhone 5 or 6, whatever they're at now, um, without having to use the resources of the IT department. Or maybe there was a problem with my BPN a while ago or, you know, a few days ago and I thought it was resolved. I marked it closed, but, you know, it's not. I'm still having the same problem. I can go ahead and reopen that. So, again, kind of like that when you get assigned a case number. Um, if it's an ongoing problem or continuation of a previous problem that was thought to be resolved, you don't want to start from scratch. You want to keep that history of what, what, what attempts have been made to fix the problem up until this point, what was successful, what didn't work. Um, so that way it just helps better resolve, you know, the problem without starting from scratch. So now I'm going to flip back to my technician's view of, um, so another way that tickets can be created is if the employee or customer calls the technician. So uh, the first thing I'm going to want to do is probably find out who I'm talking with. Maybe their name is Joe and maybe I couldn't quite hear what their last name was, but I can look through and sound like Jackson. All right, was that Joe Jackson? All right, Joe. Well, Joe's explaining the problem to me. I can click here to look at a history of, of incidents that Joe has reported. Maybe Joe just sent an email in 10 minutes ago or went to the web portal and created a ticket. Now he's calling up again to make sure we got it. I, again, I don't want to create duplicate tickets so I can see what, Joe, you know, what tickets Joe currently has open. Or maybe um, there was an incident that was closed, but it, I, after talking to Joe, it sounds like you know, that problem was never really resolved. So I'm going to go ahead and reopen that for Joe. Now, if it is a new problem, again, I can come over here and maybe Joe cannot connect to his VPN. So as I toggle to assign that to myself, I also have the option to assign it to another user or even a team, like a tier two team or another, another group, depending on the nature of the problem. But if you notice off to the right in yellow here, it's letting me know that uh, there's some tr uh, trends going on here, that at least three other people are having problems right now or at this time having problems connecting to the VPN. So similar to email is that if I have one user that can't get their email, it's probably their settings. However, if I have a bunch of users that all of a sudden can't get to their email, chances are it's probably something bigger than that. It could be the network or it could be the Exchange server itself. So in which case, 
I can look down here to see that there is actually a problem reported. I can look to see if that sounds like what my, what Joe is having issues with. If it is, I can then associate this incident with the problem. This is helpful from uh, multiple ways. One is that when I resolve that main network problem, I can then review all my incidents and I can close them, close them all with one mass action. The second is if that if I gave them an ETA of 3 o'clock this afternoon that the problem should be fixed, and all of a sudden we're looking like there's no way we're going to meet that deadline, it's looking more like 5, I don't want to go back in and have to touch every one of those tickets to give an update status. I also don't want to have all those people start calling in at 3 o'clock being upset saying, hey, I still can't get to my email or my VPN. So I, again, with the mass action tool, I can say, hey, notify all in customers or employees you know, associated with problem number 11795 that we apologize about the delay, but it looks like 5 o'clock, you know, 5 o'clock is a new ETA. And lastly, is that at the end of the day, at the end of the month, if somebody asks me, well, how many employees or customers were affected by that outage earlier in the week, I have all that information right at my fingertips. I can explain exactly how many, you know, people reported the problems at that time and how long the outage lasted. Now, if it is an isolated situation, this right here is telling me that I have some related documents. I can then just do a search for it and then check off the documents that I want to send to the employees. And those could be screenshots, those could just be texts, or those could be even linked to videos on how to. Now, oftentimes when I have a problem, there could be several tasks that have to be related and that have to be completed. In which case, I can come over here to my tasks and let's just say that maybe I have an employee that's in Chicago that's complaining that their uh, application is running too slow. Through my system diagnostics, I noticed they only had 128 megabits of RAM. Well, the first thing I want to do is have purchasing, and maybe that's Bo. I need him to order some memory. I'm going to give him the, the specs, and I'm going to have them send those to the Chicago office. I'm then going to create another task for receiving to notify everyone that once that, that RAM has been received, and then the third step that I'm going to have is that my facilities person in Chicago, I need them to install that. Once each of those are checked off, and obviously those have to go in a chronological order, I can't install it until I've received it, and certainly has to be purchased before then. So once all three of those tasks have been completed, I'm going to get notification that that, that has been completed. I can then call up Joe, and I can uh, go over the applications with him to see if he's seen the improvement. If so, then I can go ahead and close out that ticket. Now, when tickets are not responded to, or I'm sorry, not closed, it's not always because we haven't got to them yet. So go to assist remote support does, I'm sorry, service desk does give you the ability to give an update of the status. Maybe I'm waiting for that customer to get back to me, or maybe I'm working on it, there's a ticket issued, or maybe I'm waiting for a certain part to come in. So if somebody is to look over and see that we have 20 open tickets, it's not just that, yeah, we haven't got to those, we're that backed up. It could be that we can't move on until something happens. Same thing with resolve tickets. It's not always that maybe there's no response to it or there's no um, resolution to a problem, but I don't want to mark it as closed um, and I don't want to just leave it open as if, you know, again, we're backed up, but I may want to you know, put a status saying it's closed, but there's no solution available or it's a workaround or maybe we just keep it plain and simple, hey, we closed it and everything is resolved. So now when an incident is major and it affects uh, other departments or maybe it's reoccurring, it may require a major change, in which case I can come up here and create a change. And maybe we need to upgrade a, a server so it's not an individual. Um, it's on an individual's device, but uh, I can go through here. I can sign it to, you know, maybe our IT department tier two. I can explain when it's when it's due by. I'm going to create a change. So that's going to create a task for them, in which case uh, they're going to make a major change. And one of the things that they can also do is they can associate that with a particular device, uh, whether it be a server or maybe it's the individual. So this can be done on both a change as well as an incident. If I was to put a search in on Brian, see all the assets, I can either assign it to my workstation or to my MacBook. If I do want to see the history of what's going on with that PC, I can click on it. Now I have uh, the history of all the different incidents that have been opened on that particular device. So if I was to look at this, obviously a VPN seems to be a uh, reoccurring problem right here, so we might need to get them a new client, as is uh, quite a few reoccurring issues there. So the next one I'm going to do is talk about reporting and then customization 
and then we're going to move on to uh, the third and final module, which would be the, the monitor. So these particular reports are um, SLA, or these are more static reports. So if I want to see, you know, how well we're doing on the different types of prioritization, you know, it looks like uh, we haven't had any P1 so far this time period, but, you know, we're 100% for our P2s. So it looks like we slipped a little bit in our P P3s. And that's it. So maybe we need to put a little bit more priority on when we say it's going to be done within 24 to 48 hours. It seems to to slip a little bit. And those are customizable so that you can you can set those up uh, whatever you know a P1 or P2, whatever number of hours that your company's policy is. And those don't have to be seen by the employees or customers. You may just want to do it as your own internal goal. But it's not like any team or SLA that you have with the customer that if you don't meet those goals, you're going to you owe them some compensation. I can also have a line graph that tells me how, how often tickets are coming in or rates. Maybe I can look at this and say, last time we did an upgrade, where Microsoft came up with an upgrade, we had this many more tickets that came in. We had a huge spike, in which case maybe we want to uh, send out messages to employees that there is going to be an upgrade coming up this Saturday or whatever the case may be. They do not need to create a ticket. There will be a slowdown or there will be a different appearance. Or maybe there's nothing you can do about it. You just know there's going to be more um, uh, more calls coming in that day, more incidents created, in which case you maybe want to staff a little bit better or make sure you don't, you know, schedule other, like, meetings or projects during that time. I can also, for scheduling-wise, I can see what the trend is. Do, are we getting the most tickets coming in on, you know, on Monday morning, but then there seems to be a lull on Wednesday afternoons, in which case that's a good time to be doing projects or, you know, have uh, uh, staff meetings at that time. So it will tell me not only the, the days of the week, but also that the hours of the day, the number of tickets that are coming in. I can also see what type of tickets are coming in. If I want to see where, you know, if my budget's being reduced or why is it that, you know, we're using more hours this month or this quarter than we did, you know, in quarter one, I can look back and say, well, you know, it looks like we're having more incidents coming in from mobile devices or particular pro uh, software. Um, is giving us more problems, in which case maybe we need to go back to that manufacturer and say, hey, we need some more training, you need to fix these bugs, or maybe we need to look at, um, you know, replacing that tool because it's, you know, accounting for a majority of our IT support hours. I can see the activity. I've got uh, customer satisfaction reports. And although this does allow employees to put down why they may have gave you a smiley face or eh, or not such a happy face, it doesn't require it, but if you, hopefully you can get them at least just to check off one of these so you can know, hey, that, that solution worked, or man, maybe maybe it's not enough, um, or you know, obviously in this case, you might want to get back to the employees, any of these right here, saying, you know, it looks like you weren't that satisfied. Is there anything we could have done differently? Again, this is going to help you improve your process, you know, the feedback they got. Maybe the solution you gave them didn't help them all the way. There was an additional step that you were not aware that was missing. Also, incident reporting. Uh, this is going to tell you, you know, uh, trends that are happening. Um, it will also break down where maybe the backlog is. You know, when an employee or customer opens a ticket at noon, the clock to them starts ticking, but maybe the technician didn't get it until 3.30 in the afternoon. So, and maybe they resolved it with by 4 o'clock. So the technician is thinking it took, four, uh, took 30 minutes to resolve. The customer is thinking it took four hours. This will break down how quickly did we resolve or did we respond to the customer? How quickly did we resolve it? How quickly from the response to resolve or response to close? So it really kind of breaks down where the bottleneck is. We also have ad hoc reports. And that allows you to actually create your dashboards. As you saw here, that I've got these different views that I think are important to me. Maybe there's a... Um, uh, you know, we're in renewing a contract with BT customer, and I want to see any open tickets out there. We want to, uh, I can also make an action item that says, you know, um, upgrade any tickets for BT customer, um, you know, because we want to make sure that, you know, our service to them and, and all customers, but um, at this time, it doesn't look good if, you know, we have like a bunch of overdue tickets, and maybe I can pull up another report that shows me overdue tickets for BT customer or for another um, for another customer bear construction here. So in order for me to uh, create a view or a report that has an action item to it, um, I would just come up here, click on the report. I've got all these different categories or um, the, the status of the tickets in. Maybe I want to pull it up for a particular customer. Once I click on that, I can then look at a list of my different customers. And a second 
might be just show me the ones that the SLA is met or not SLA is met, or you know which ones are overdue or not overdue. So it's very easy to create these reports on, on the fly. And once you have those reports, you can have that emailed to you. You know, uh, maybe you know every morning at five o'clock, you want a list of all tickets that are overdue that we didn't meet our SLA. Or maybe if you have a salesperson that's in charge of BT customer that they don't care about any ticket that's open, but if a ticket is overdue, you know, add them to the watch list. You know, we don't want that customer calling a salesperson complaining about an issue and the salesperson is caught blindsided. So uh, uh, service test does have built-in automation, and that would allow you to do things from escalated to maybe close out any tickets that have been marked resolved, but there's been no action on it for two weeks. Or in the, the last example is I can add somebody to that watch list or maybe reassign it to a tier two person. If, so for the action items, if it is overdue, I would just click here and then I create my action item. And again, that might be add somebody to, uh, to the watch list right here or maybe change the, the assignment to another department. Or maybe if it's uh, coming in and it's a MacBook. And again, there's only certain people we talked about earlier, if there's certain fields that are checked off, is this a home device or is this a MacBook or a mobile device, you may want to send it to a different group of people um, or maybe it's just a keyword. So that's where the automation piece really comes in. So the last piece on the service desk I want to talk about is the uh, asset management. So it's one of the things that separates us from uh, several of the other tools is that there is the asset management. And assets could be anywhere from people to offices, to workstations, printers, servers. And there's a couple of different ways that this can be populated. If I look at my workstations here, I can import it into a CSV file. And basically, if I have a list of the different devices and the certain attributes that are important for me to track, you know, what do we pay for it? What is the warranty good for? What is the serial number for Dell or HP? I can import it in. But uh, as a segue into our final module, the monitor in here, uh, another way to do is I can click on import devices. So what we're going to talk about in a minute is the monitor. And the monitor will go out there and find all the different devices that are on your network. And this is typically going to be more for companies that are in-house IT departments as opposed to customers. But at this point here, maybe I'm an MSP and I have multiple customers. I can come over here and say, all right, you know, I want to import in Century Ecology. We set up the, uh, the monitor on that a few days ago. So I want to take all those assets and I want to import it into my knowledge base. But maybe I don't want all the assets. I do want the switches. I don't care so much about the phones. I do want the printer. I can go ahead and check off the devices that I want to import into service desk because when I create a ticket, typically it's going to involve some type of device that is having a problem or needs, uh, needs work on it. And I want to associate it. So I want to see a history of all the work that's been done on that device. And I don't want to have to add those devices in manually. So this allows me to go ahead and import that in. Once they are imported in, I can see what the history of those uh, devices are so that I know what devices need to be replaced. Or maybe I want to make sure that we're in compliance with our software. You know, if we have a license for 50 seats of office, I want to make sure that we don't, we're not using 60 and you know, we're looking at a hefty fine you know, for not being in compliance. But again, as I talked about before, I can click on this Brian's PC. I can see there's been 23 incidents created. Uh, this, I can also see if there's been any discussion as far as replacing this or relationship. Maybe this is located in my Tempe office and it's owned by Brian Thompson. So I can build these different relationships so that I know that if I did have a problem with maybe one of my locations and there was a natural disaster, I know how many devices are there. Or maybe if one of my switches goes down, I know what devices are connected to that switch port or that entire switch. So if those devices are offline, it's understandable that that's all related to the problem with that switch. So as soon as we can fix that switch, chances are it's going to take up all those different uh, devices there. So um, the configuration management and there's also time management to be able to track how much time we're spending on not only particular customers but certain tasks or certain projects. So all that can be done. So again, if if we want to find out what our biggest abuses as far as locations or uh, individuals, or maybe it's the products themselves or machines. You know, hey, we upgraded to this patch, and that's given us problems, so we know we don't want to upgrade anybody else to that. Or maybe, you know, people in other parts of the country have had a, a lot of problems with a certain software version, and we don't want to buy that one. So we get a history of what's going on. Again, that software could be 
an asset so you can associate an incident not only with that device but also with that piece of software so you can see kind of like your own tracking or uh, social media to find out what other people in your company and what success that they've had. Okay, so the final piece here is monitoring. And the way monitoring works is that there is a data collector uh, that's going to go out there and, and scan uh, each of your networks. And you could have 100 devices at one location or 10 devices in each of 10 locations. And it's going to go out there, and all you have to do is install uh, the data collector on one device, and it will grab everything that gets an IP address on that network and bring it in. That, so it's going to scan all those devices. But then you can pick and choose which one to monitor. So this is our first data collector here. I can choose uh, which networks I want to go ahead and scan. I can add multiple subnets or just a range, .51 to .75. Um, on the same lines, I can also exclude certain networks. If I know there's certain IP addresses that are used for handheld devices or guest networks, I'm not so concerned about those, so I can go ahead and ignore those. The second type of data collector would be an off-LAN. So for companies, which today the, this, the list of companies is, is certainly growing, is the ability to keep track of devices that are off your network. And uh, many employees don't even VPN in any longer, uh, that they're able to get access to their SAFs. Uh, tools like uh, Salesforce and Citrix. So, um, but you also, but you still want to keep track of those devices. So, uh, you can set up an um, offline data collector agent, like a mini agent, on those machines. So, if I have an office that has 50 employees and 40 of them are in the office and 10 are salespeople or remote workers, I can run a list on all the devices that are on that network, all the software that's on there. So, it's going to include not only the 40 but also the the 10 remote workers as well. The third type is the ability to uh, be able to search for uh, websites. That could be a website. That could be a um, ISP connection to a remote location. And it's going to let you know if um, if the site goes down or if users are getting a 404 error. Uh, so just because you can ping a server or ping a, uh, um, a website doesn't necessarily mean that the site is up and that the users are getting the content that you want them to. So this is able to check for um, port numbers as well as um, to uh, remote access. So once I collect all that information through my offland and my, my data collector on the network, it's going to separate and use a um, smart um, query to identify and separate. I can say, hey, these are all my servers. I can look at those and click on any one of these devices. I can see the status of what's going on, the performance, memory, CPU. I can see the hardware that's located on these devices. And if I did notice that the CPU or, um, or memory, that there was a problem, I could very easily, I could very easily just uh, connect to it because I do have, um, this is integrated with, with uh, my remote support tool. Uh, but this is going to tell me all the processes, uh, logical memory, BIOS, and what have you, as well as CPU and memory. I can have workstations. I can also have printers. Uh, if I want to keep track of what's going on with uh, the printers as far as ink, uh, whether it's online or not, or maybe I'm out of paper, I'm able to uh, set up alerts on that. Again, I can visually look at it. Well, that's fine. But what's really important is actually if I send an alert, and you don't have to pay any extra for who you send alerts to. You can send alerts to billing facilities or Marion Accounting who's going to handle those alerts. Maybe those aren't necessarily IT related. What would be considered IT related would be more of these Windows tasks. So I want you to follow along about how easy this would be to set up. I can go ahead and um, set up for Windows monitoring if I'm running low on disk space. And this could be on a workstation or server. If it's below 10% or below 1 gig, I want to get notified. If there's a bad block, if the CPU is going over a certain threshold, and again, look how easy this is. Hey, if it's up to 70%, that's fine. Between 70 and 90%, you know, notify my level one users. If it gets over 90, notify level two. I don't care so much about spikes, but if it does last more than 5, 10, 20 minutes, you know, based on my baseline, that's when I'm going to determine that there is an issue. Maybe I don't want to get notified about every workstation. I'm only concerned with my servers. Again, kind of like group policies, I can go ahead and check that off. So it's only going to apply to my servers or, and any other group that I want to. I want to apply that to, I can also come up with 
you know, some policies that say, you know, notify me after 20 minutes, where there's another group that, hey, don't notify me until it's been after 30 minutes. So it's really easy to create these alerts, and then you create your notification rules. There, we also have full reporting, which would allow you to get an executive report so you can see any outages or new devices on the network. I can also uh, do an inventory of all my devices, just my Windows, just my Mac, um, or any other assets that have been retired. I also have full uh, software audit, again, to help you within compliance. If I know I want to upgrade any machines that are running uh, Office XP, which is about 12 years old right now, I can run a list. I can see all the machines that still have that on there and print out that list and you know, put that on as you know, devices you know, that we need to upgrade the office on. I have also have dashboards that I can build that's going to tell me the CPU or you know, uh, what's running on my different service, service, uh, server CPU. Uh, this will also work on my um, uh, VMware or Zen server monitoring. Let me know what the, the hosts are doing. I can see the, you know, that my two uh, physical machines are up. I can see the server and the CPUs on those, but I can also see my virtual machines too. It looks like I've got four of those that are down. So much memory, and I can customize as far as what information I want to see within here. I've got my different dashboards, and then I've got my different panels that I can add to those dashboards. Just to uh, follow, uh, finish up here with. Uh, the monitoring. It does a great job of alerting inventory. Again, all that inventory can then be uploaded and synced with my service desk so that I know what devices are on there. And if any new devices come on there, those are also going to be added to service desk uh, through the integration so I can track who has what so that if somebody was to maybe leave the organization, I know what equipment we need to take from them. Uh, if the employees or if we're Currently, have a lot of Dell machines, which a lot of organizations obviously do, as well as HPs. But again, I can come up with a smart group that's going to identify where um, just the, in this group right here, just my Dell machines. Um, I don't have to have employees crawling underneath the table to get that service tag number from them. I can also click on this link, and that's going to go to Dell's website, as you can see down below. And it's actually going to tell me how long that warranty, when it expires, you know, is it still current. And this download is because it knows that this is an Optiplex 780. It's going to provide, just through this link right here, it's going to provide me all the drivers that I need for this particular machine so I don't have to go searching through the Dell tree looking for all the, the, the different drivers for this particular machine. I can also add some custom fields too as far as what I paid for it, what uh, the expiration date, where it's located right here through the monitor. So, one special uh, bonus that I wanted to, uh, to show you today was a mock-up of a typical customer site. So, um, and here it is here. So this could be a support page for a customer, in which case when they click on contact uh, or support, you can have the typical, hey, here's the mailing address, they can call in, or they can email. But again, you can put this on your own site. Maybe this is where they contacted you. You got a call from them, and you need to look at their, their, their desktop. You can create your code through the remote support, and then just say, hey, at the bottom of the support page, go ahead and put in your name and this nine-digit code and click connect. So it makes it very easy for them to get connected to you. Maybe uh, you want to have them uh, create a ticket submitted through email. When they click on here, it's going to be uh, self-addressed to the support page with title, you know, uh, support request or they could go to that web portal, or maybe it's a knowledge base. You want them to click through the knowledge base, try to find a problem on their own. Again, here I can uh, pull up my, my knowledge base. So this is for employees. We're actually, um, em and employees, since it's integrated with Active Directory, it's going to come right into the knowledge base. They can search that. They can create a new incident. Uh, customers, very unlikely, they're going to be part of your knowledge base, so they would just go ahead and add a, um, or they just put in their name and password. For customers, you can allow them to create a, an account right online, and basically all they have to do is create an account, and they just put in their name and their email address, just so you know who you're working with, uh, who has uh, gained access to your knowledge base. You can uh, limit that to certain uh, domains, or you can open up for anybody. But you can also have different views that say, hey, customers with this domain get access to this data content where anybody else, whether they're coming in Gmail or Yahoo email accounts, they get access to this very limited, very public information. The other thing on here, and this does come included with 
remote support is the ability to create a chat session and this would be coming in um, as uh, um, it allows them to chat with one of your technicians and uh, what's nice about it is that if just a simple question is ABC work with XYZ the te technicians can answer that and maybe send them a link to the frequently asked questions or the solution um, but they can also escalate that chat session up into screen sharing so if you know what seems like a, a, a simple request at first turns out to be more complicated I can go well you know it's probably best if I just look at your desktop so the technician would only have to back here would only have to um, click one button to say alright let's go ahead and escalate this up into screen sharing so here's that request that came in uh, it's already been closed since I, I, I closed it out there but there'd be another button right here that says um, escalate the screen share and again it's going to ask that employee did you want to share your screen with Brian Thompson did they acknowledge it I get a support session there so that way they don't have to enter nine digit code or even click on a link because it is all integrated together and so we have the, being a, the ability to create a ticket to be able to search a knowledge base again you might even want to reverse the order as you might want to prefer them to go to the knowledge base first but they can go directly to create a ticket through email to the web portal where they can also chat with one of your representatives. If they're already in a conversation with your representative, they can go ahead and just put in their name and nine digit code. And again, this is something that could all be on your own website. Well, that concludes the live portion of my demo here. We can go ahead and open it up to any questions about our remote support service desk or monitoring tool. Will that catch it, uh, Brenda? Sure. Okay. Sure. So, uh, for the help desk, for the tickets, does it keep track of time that the ticket took to resolve to get resolved? Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry about the ticket that's been resolved. What was that about the ticket? Does it keep track of time? This question is: Does it keep it's track of the yeah, time yeah. that it takes to close the ticket? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, it does. So there is a running clock. So as soon as the ticket is opened right here at uh, at uh, 149 here in Arizona, so that that's a running clock there. Now, if I have the option, or I mean, you can turn this on or turn this off as administrators. But if maybe I'm waiting for that employee to get back to me, or maybe I stepped away for a minute, I can actually pause that so that that running clock stops. But if it's something where you're in and out, and you just know that it took about a total of an hour in order to resolve that situation. You can also enter it in right here. You can mark whether it's billable or not, but you can put down 1.5 and then keyword uh, email. So you can see how much time we're spending there. So that would have your imported time in, and then over here it, it will also tell you how how long with the running clock did it take you to resolve that issue from the time that it, it, it was open to the time it was closed. And that can be uh, reports can be run on the amount of time for a particular customer, ABC customer. You know how much billable hours, how much non-billable hours, or list all the billable hours so we can explain, you know, our billing. Um, or if we still want to track how much time is being spent that's non-billable, and maybe you know we might need to reprice our service contract with them. So in an IT department, you can build different departments. Uh, that, that is correct, yep, and you can get give different users, which would be your technical users, um, the ability to service one or multiple uh, departments or all departments, but yeah, you can separate, say, you know, your one department from another. Um, you can also create, in our incident over here, we talked about uh, two different departments using this tool. One could be for IT support. But another one could be for HR, and employees could, they might need to uh, open an IT support ticket, or maybe they need a list of their benefits, um, or, or they need to sign compliance letters so they can get it, they can search for it, you know, how much vacation time do we get, or what's the travel policy, again, that information could be here. Or maybe it's HR that's requesting an on, you know, a, a new hire, and we need to add them to Active Directory, we need to sign them a computer and maybe a laptop. In which case, uh, we actually do have templates, which have all those steps included. So as soon as they have a new hire come in, you know these five steps have to be completed by IT department, 
Um, or the same thing when if uh, somebody leaves the department, it could be maybe a termination. And again, uh, eight, uh, the uh, IT department knows that, hey, we need to suspend their account in Active Directory. We need to recover their assets. We need to remove them from this, you know, capture, you know uh, recapture their, their badge, or whoever takes care of that. On the, back on your incident uh, tab, uh, upper mm -hmm. left-hand corner, I guess where we were, no, 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 um, where you were just at before you went back here. So, okay. uh, of your IT support. At the very okay. first page, the support page, I guess you could say. For the technician or for the customer? Sorry, your, your um, remote support. Your remote support. Oh, okay. uh, dashboard or interface. Yeah, dashboard. So on remote support, um, let's see, how are the machines discovered? Is it through an agent, like a GoToMyPC agent? Is this uh, like a combination of GoToMyPC and um, GoToMeeting? And it <laughs> well, seems like this was our first product we ever came out with like 14 what? years ago. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that was the original platform. So everything else has spawned from gotcha, the GoToMyPC gotcha, gotcha. platform. Yeah, because I... I've not used this before, but I've used the other ones. Okay, but for this purpose. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Neat. So is it the agents from that are installed on the other machines? Um, yeah, Brian can address that. Brian, you want to address how machines are discovered? or? Sure. sure. Yeah. Now, agents are not required on that, where go to my PC requires an agent on that to be get access in advance. But I could have an employee at home on a brand new Windows 8 machine that needs to get access. Um, all I'd have to do is send them the link or send them to that web page and they just uh, they click on the link or they enter the nine digit code and then I'm able to see their device without ever installing anything on their machine. They do not need to be administrators, they could be non administrators. I can help them and that's the attended session. Now if I do need to get into that machine after hours, I could just set up a small agent. In this case it would be similar to go to my PC, it would just be a small agent. I put those in a certain group and I decide who has access to that. When you do click on it, uh, you just enter your Windows credentials, so there's not like a secondary code that has to be put in. It's actually, um, it, it just takes you to the desktop and then you log in. Is there a rule that you can set up for the folks that are um, the different compliances where they have to allow permissions to get in there? Um, um, well, we have 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 that. You, you can push this out through group policies and uh, that would be through the, for the MSI, so it's automatically going to install it on all the different machines. So that if you did need to get access yeah. to it after hours, uh, you'd have that agent on there. Okay. You you were showing how you can have multiple technicians come in and view a system. Is it just uh, everybody mm -hmm. except for you has um, uh, read capabilities, or is there multiple uh, read write capabilities? I guess to interact. Yeah. So. Um, Keyboard and mouse control, yeah. So you, you'd, uh, but when they come in, you can decide whether they, uh, you want to give them keyboard and mouse control um, or not. Know. And then, um, or in, in, you can give everybody a keyboard and mouse control, you know, when they're coming into the session. And then, then they can, you'd have priority over them as far as if I want to move, you know, click on this and they want to click on this. My, my keyboard, keyboard is not moving. Move. Okay. And then the Again, file transfer, transfer, you said it was a two-way file transfer. Is it something that can be scanned? Because, you know, they said, you said that, uh, well, like virus scan. If they're pushing something from their home computer, I mean, a lot of times the end user is uh, local admin to their home computers, and if their kit jumps on it and downloads all kinds of junk, can we scan it before we receive it? Um. You ask them to send you something. Go to assist won't, won't scan it, but if you're, um, you're any virus, um, would like to scan that. As it's coming across. Yeah. You can decide whether you want to accept that. Cool. For the service desk, is there a mobile agent? Uh, uh, not yet. That is something that's uh, that is coming out um, soon. Uh, you, you soon. can use the the browser to create a ticket um, or to um, respond to a ticket, but uh, the app is not out yet. Which platform are you going to do first? 
Android. Um, um, I believe it's Android. Coming up first. It, it, yeah, uh, well, uh, you have to submit uh, to Apple approval. Uh, uh, that takes you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Work in progress. One question on the service desk. Does it uh, keep track of projects? Because this is tickets. What if there is projects that has different tasks and then tasks get built to a project? Yeah. So you can put um, yeah different billing codes to uh, associate it. Like for this particular project, we're going to build three hours towards HR and you know an hour towards this department here. We're just in general. So yeah, you, you can put in billing codes to associate it with that. So you can track that. And due to time, I didn't go into the full. You know, it is ITIL based. So um, we we talked about incidents can be associated with problems. We talked a little bit about change, but there's also release management and knowledge base management as well. Like a separate project module. It's called Podio. Oh. It's a whole other subject. <laughs> we don't have yeah, a project right. base, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Brian. That was really good. Appreciate it. You're, you're welcome. If there's any other questions, um, you can just uh, send them to um, BJ, and BJ knows how to track me down. All right. All right. Have a great Have day. A good day.